The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. Well then, Bunya, it's time for the main course, the feature presentation, the main event, the title bout, the money shot, the Royal Rumble match of the podcast. Yes. And this week, it is a doozy. It's a doozy because of all of the names I get to drop. Mr. See You Next Wednesday, John Landis. Yeah. The head of the Clopex, Mr. Henry Gibson. Yes. The magician, Bill frickin' Bixby. Uh-huh. The frickin' Zucker Brothers. And, of course, the world's greatest movie producer of all time, Samuel L. Bronkowitz. Yeah. This week's film really did start a trend, too. It's important to note. It showed people that in order to be a film, you really didn't need a plot. All you needed is humor and a vague yeah. script to connect a series of bizarre scenes. This movie created a sort of genre. It certainly wasn't the first cough, cough, groove tube. No. But this movie's popularity created a genre that spawned a multitude of copycat skit films including but not limited to such uh, cheesy skit films as Amazon Women on the Moon, yes, Movie 43, UHF, 12 Years a Slave, the ridiculously silly comedy from Paul Haggis called Crash. The list goes on and on. Yes. But of all of those loosely connected montage comedies, this is most definitely the best. It's the 1977 John Landis Zucker Brothers comedy gem, Kentucky Fried Movie. Mm -hmm. The podcast you're listening to has been pissed in more at 11. Yes. And before we dive into this movie, I would like, if I may, to... Devote, devote a few moments of our precious podcasting time to make the following public service announcement. Now is the perfect time for you, Bunny, to add some sad music to this in post if you want to. I'm not saying you have to, and I don't want okay. you to think I'm guilting you into adding sad music. But if you were to add sad music, sad uh, uh, copyright free music. Now would be the perfect time. Okay. Did you know that every day here in America, hundreds of thousands of actors go without jobs? Yes. These poor, hungry actors sometimes go for months, sometimes even years, without a sizable reoccurring role in a television show or even a bit part in a crappy movie on the sci-fi network. Yeah. But you can help. Yes, for just pennies a day, you can help feed D.B. Sweeney. You can help clothe Anthony Michael Hall. Yes. You can make sure Gina Gershon has a roof over her head. Yes, even you can help save Gina Davis. Yes. Give generously, won't you? Thank you. So the Kentucky Fried movie. I love this goddamn movie. I, I know. I, I was laughing out loud to it again. Again. Like I haven't seen it a hundred times already. I love this goddamn movie. And you know what I would love? Let me tell you what I would love to see. I would love it if they made a sequel, but instead of calling it Kentucky Fried Movie 2, they mimic Kentucky Fried Chicken and just call it KFM. Yes. Because it's not Kentucky Fried Chicken anymore. It's it's KFC. And you so know what? It's just called sequel KFM. You know what? John Landis owes us. Okay? He, yes. He owes, you know, you kill a couple of Vietnamese children and... and, and, and... I forgot his name. I had it there for a second. You you owe us. There's blood on your hands. We need more funny. Yeah. John Landis. 
the director of such legendary films as Beverly Hills Cop 3 and Blues Brothers 2000. The man's a comic genius. Which which gets me really pissed off whenever he's whenever he's called a horror master. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like he made one fucking horror movie, guys. I mean, yes, it's a good movie, but and the thriller horror video. Master? Yeah. Yeah. When I was little, he did Animal I, House. Yeah. When I was little, I didn't know about the fact that he likes to sneak the phrase see you next Wednesday into all of his movies. Really? Yeah, he likes to sneak see you next Wednesday into all of his movies because that's a line that's used in uh what, 2001? Yeah. It's like the last line that some character says in the movie. Hey, see you next Wednesday. And he just thought that that was such a weird, bizarre line that he just decided, I'm going to put that in all of my movies, which is why when uh, when a, a feel around or the I think that's what it's called, feel around. Yes. Yeah. When he goes to see that movie, the movie's called See You Next Wednesday. And. Um, oh, so, yeah, oh, and oh you're animal- talking about an actual movie. No, that was sense around. Oh, sense around. OK, yeah. Yeah, but the movie that he goes to see is called See You Next Wednesday. Uh-huh. And it's hidden in various things. In fact, the first time I ever heard that phrase was in John Landis's fucking thriller video. Because <laughs> fucking uh, Michael Jackson is, is watching the movie with his girlfriend, and his girlfriend leaves while Michael Jackson stays for a second to watch the movie. And you hear the people on the screen go, there's a note. What does it say? It says, see you next Wednesday. (laughs) Look out. And then there's a scream and the monster attacks. And that's when Michael Jackson leaves the theater. And I thought that that was so weird. See you next Wednesday. And then I saw other John Landis movies and I went, oh, holy shit. See you next Wednesday is in everything. Yeah. Yeah. See you next Wednesday has its own Wikipedia page. Because not only does John Landis force that into all of his movies, but now a bunch of other non-John Landis people also work it into their films as kind of like a cool reference or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. See you next Wednesday. I have not picked up on that. I'm just I'm just thinking how funny the negotiations must be on that. Just picture just picture because, you know, Michael Jackson would be kind of a control freak about things. So yeah. John Landis would have had to have fight, would have to fight to get in the line. See you next Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. Like no, yeah. no, Michael. I am putting my foot down. I, I, I will do this, but I will not do it unless the line, see you yeah. next Wednesday, is in here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, this will be difficult. This will be a difficult movie to discuss because the movie defies genres it defies basic script structure yeah it defies basic description and what this means is that this film was surprisingly hard for me to try and pin down in a podcast sort of setting describing the plot of the film is nearly impossible so we definitely won't be doing that well there's 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 definitely no plot whatsoever yeah not it's all. a hard film. Yeah. What? No, I, I assume that she, you gave her the cookie. Did you give her a cookie? What? Did you just give her a cookie? Did you give her a cookie? Oh, she's ah, she's there you go. She took Bella's cookie. There you go. Screw you. My cookie. I'm saving it. Stop hoarding food. That was... Bella's a food hoarder. <laughs> so... This is a hard film to discuss because the film itself, the focus keeps changing on the film. So before we get to the story of the making of Kentucky Fried Movie, in keeping with the ever-changing plot of Kentucky Fried Movie, I'm going to completely switch gears now. Completely, unexpectedly, and uh, talk about dead Indians instead. Okay. You see, there has been an idea gestating in my brown noggin for quite a while now, an idea for a randomly occurring segment here on the show that I haven't had time for until now. 
Plus, it makes a strange, perverse, perverse sort of sense to have our discussion of Kentucky Fried Movie be a random hodgepodge of various subjects, just like the film. Yeah. So this new randomly occurring segment came to me uh, from all of the fun that I have doing story times here on the podcast, where I take the history of an uh, actor or director and the making of the film, and I get all of this information and sort of approximate it into a fun story in my own unique voice. So occasionally here on the podcast, I will be doing that sort of story time, but with history. With history. Yes, so I will be getting uh, moments in history and uh, uh, reworking them into my own voice with this first episode of what I am calling Steve's Historical Approximations. Okay. And this week, we are talking... What? You got a fruit snack without acting? Without acting? You, you know you need to act like a pirate every time you have fruit snacks. So act like a pirate. Act like a pirate, I said. Or you don't get the fruit snacks. No, act like an adult. Okay, well, ask me if you can have fruit snacks. Yes, but first you need to act like a pirate. Our that was a really good pirate. Uh, yes, you can eat that, but give one to Eleanor. It's called Eleanor Tex. Give one of them to Eleanor, and then you can have the rest. Steve's historical approximations. This week, we are talking about the Osagi Indian murders. Okay. You don't know about the Osagi Indian murders? Kentucky Fried Movie was so funny. Go ahead. Indian Murders. Kentucky Fried Movie was really funny, but we are going to be talking about the Osagi Indian Murders. There's a new book about the subject that just recently came out called um, Blood of the Flower Moon or Flower of the Blood Moon. Something about murdering flowers. So... <laughs> So um, let's talk about the Osagi murders. I am surprised. I am surprised that this happened and not surprised that America doesn't talk about it. Because surprise, surprise, America has a longstanding history of fucking Native Americans over. Yes. Surprise, surprise. America has a history of screwing Native Americans in the ass. You it's, see this, it's Larry? A, it's a hobby. You, you see know. this, Larry? Unless you're watching this on TV. This is what you get, Larry. This is what you get when you find a stranger in the Alps. <laughs> so, um... So the government is like, hey, Native Americans, uh, you can't be in this uh, land anymore because we want it. So we're going to move you to this state. And, uh, yeah, you're going to have to walk there. I sh we should have told you that, too. We're not giving you a ride. Just walk to this totally different state. Okay, now this is your state. Now you stay here. You know what? No, no, we like this state now. <laughs> We're going to move you to this different piece of land. This is some really shitty land, and we don't want it. So, uh, yeah, pick up your shit and walk to this other state. This is going to be your land now because uh, we want that state that we gave you originally because yeah. it looks pretty. And uh, it goes with our eyes. So walk, <laughs> to the, walk, to this, walk to this other piece of land. It's really crappy. And uh, there you go. Now this is your land. Now, ooh, wait, we like this land. Like, we hated the land until we gave it to you, and now that it's yours, we totally want this land back. So here, here's this other bit of land. You're going to have to walk there, too. So uh, the government was doing this to the Osagi Indians until eventually they found, uh, they gave the Osagi Indians this crappy, dead, barren, lifeless land in Oklahoma. Okay. Right? Okay. But here's the shittiest land in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. Have fun with it. We definitely will not want the land back because it's Oklahoma and Oklahoma fucking sucks. So you know what? Here, we'll even put it in writing. Here you go. Uh, 1907. I'm putting this in writing. The government will not take this land from the Osagis. Ha ha. Burn on them. We gave them shitty land. Good luck with that. You SOBs. Signed, government. So, um... 
also in 1907, in the in that bit of dialogue, um, they a really long bit of uh, paperwork, a lot of information on it, and in there. The government gave every member of the Osagi tribe uh, 657 acres. And also, uh, each and every Osagi, or it's important here, the Osagi's legal heirs were given a percentage of any possible oil or natural whatever that they find on the land. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah like that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, the government signed that contract, and of course, like seconds later, they find oil. Yeah, they don't just find oil. The Osagi Indians find a shit ton of oil, <laughs> like the most oil. They found all of the oil out of nowhere. A small Indian tribe in Oklahoma becomes like the Middle East as far as oil is concerned. It's just everywhere. And just imagine, it's crazy because like, here's these Indians, they keep getting screwed and screwed and screwed and screwed and screwed. And then they blink and suddenly they're in a Snoop Dogg video. <laughs> just imagine these poor ass Indians and they keep getting screwed and keep getting screwed and they blink their eyes and suddenly they're just rich as shit. Like literally overnight, they all have mansions and limos and a bunch of the uh, Osagi family, you know, they're like poor uh, downtrodden Native Americans. And suddenly they're like, maybe we should send Junior to school in Europe. <laughs> Like, literally, they blink, and suddenly they're all rich, and it's a rap video. It's it's 1920 now, and literally, this is fucking amazing to me. It's 1920, and literally, the Osagi tribe suddenly becomes the richest people per capita in the entire world. Nice. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a crazy-ass story. You think of the entire world. The entire world. And the Osagi Indians are the richest people. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it right. I'm yeah. pretty sure I Osagi Indians. So, um, so, but, but, but here's another way to look at it. It's racist, racist ass 1920s America. Mm -hmm. And you know who the richest people are in America in 1920? A small Native American tribe. You know who had a problem with that? White America. I I would imagine that I was kind of wondering where it got there. So white fucking America had a big ass problem with the richest people in America being a uh, a small Native American tribe in Oklahoma. So this is what happened. Okay. This is so fucked up. So white America had a fucking problem with this. So in 1921, the fucking U.S. Congress, Congress, <laughs> so fucked up. Congress passes a law. And the law is basically this. Hey, you know these Osagi Indians? Yeah, they're Indians. And you know what that means? It means they're fucking stupid. Okay. So, and, and again, don't think that I'm, I, Steve, am being racist. I'm just telling the story. Here's your water bottle, Eleanor. Everything's fine. Cool, cool, cool your jets. I'm not the one being racist. I am simply trying to explain how white America is being racist. Yeah. I don't think these things. It's white America in 1921 who's saying these things, not me. So anyway, Congress passes a law, and the law is basically Indians are fucking stupid, and they cannot be trusted with this money. So each and every Osagi Indian tribe member... Kirby! Ooh, is everything okay? Oh, the dog was just ready to launch at another dog. Jesus. 
That's why you should never watch Charlie Brown cartoons around your dog. Okay, sorry. That's okay. So Congress passes a law, and the law basically says Native Americans are stupid. We can't trust them with large amounts of money. So each and every Osagi Indian tribe member will be assigned a guardian Mm -hmm. to look over their money until each and every Osagi Indian can prove to the government that they are not uh, that they are not stupid. Oh, and that they are capable of taking care of this money on their own because they're because they're they're Indians. Mm-hmm. So we're going to get white people in in Oklahoma to take care of their money, look over their money for these Native Americans as a service to them because. Lord knows they can't be trusted with this massive amount of money. They're Indians. Yeah. So here comes white America to save you. And you know what? We're going to... Don't worry about your money, Osagi Indians. We're going to get the nicest people in Oklahoma. We're going to get doctors and preachers and scientists, you know, learned men. Or at least people who say that they are doctors and scientists. Yes. And lawyers. People who say they are learned men, and they're going to be in charge of your well. Mind. Well, let's let's keep in mind that doctors and lawyers and scientists and all that were just as just every bit as racist as everybody else. So, so any of yeah. the any of the good ones would be like, no, I'm not working with filthy savages. Yeah. So then, like, say it, the Congress is passing this law, and they're like, does anyone have any questions? Yes, you in the back. Yeah, my name is Snake. Oh, did I say Snake? I mean Dr. James Johnson. <laughs> uh, let's say that uh, I am taking care of uh, these millions of dollars of uh, an Osagi Indian, and the Osagi Indian is murdered. Oh, I'm sorry. Accidentally passes on. <laughs> what happens to that money? And the the Congress said, well, that probably won't happen a lot. But if it does happen, then definitely you'll get all the money because yeah. you're a white person. And not only that, remember that law in 1907, um, you're a legal heir, so you would also get a huge percentage of the oil revenue. Oh. But it's okay. It's okay. It, that's not going to happen a lot. No. Not only that, but each and every miner in the Osagi Indian tribe was assigned a legal guardian, regardless of whether or not they had parents. <laughs> Yay. So it's like, hey, little uh, little Johnny, your new parents are the Smiths here. But my parents are right there. Yes, well, they're Indians. We're giving white parents now. <laughs> these white parents will be taking care of you they'll also be in charge of your money don't worry though nothing bad's gonna happen to you you're a child and even in 1920 bad things aren't gonna happen to you so what happened next the obvious happened yes. from 1921 to 1925 and i want to i want to point out here that's not a long period of time no that's small ass period in time, 1921 to 1925. But get this. Three from four 19- years, yeah. Yeah. Get this. From 1921 to 1925, they estimate that at least, at least 60 Osagi Indians were killed. Accidentally. Via accidents or poisonings. Or here's a racist excuse that some people used. Bad whiskey. Bad whiskey. Bad. Or in some cases, just outright murder. Literally, it, it didn't matter who you were. You were an old tribal member. You were an eight-year-old boy. Osagi Indians were being murdered left and right by white Americans who wanted a piece of all of this shit. Yes. At least 60 Osagi Indians were killed. Probably much more. A lot of the murders went unsolved. 
like a like do you like these think? <laughs> Like these Osagi Indians were spinal tap drummers. Yes. Well, let's see here. He was smoking a cigar and then he accidentally fell on these five bullets. You know what? Best to leave it unsolved. (laughs) Like really fucked up. Most of the murders went unsolved, which means, and, and I think this often, there's undoubtedly still some rich ass white folks in Oklahoma. Mm hmm. That are living in a mansion somewhere in like Enid or Ponca City. And they live in this nice neighborhood and you go up to them and you're like, hey, you guys seem to be really well off. Look at that. You got like eight cars and you're a huge lawn here that's all gated and stuff. Where'd you get your money? Oh, well, you know, just good, good investments and, <laughs> and 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 other investments that were also very good. My great grandfather certainly didn't kill a six year old Indian <laughs> for it. You know, we we've just been our money in just good investments. Yeah. In fact, sometimes like I'll see like I'll see like some commercial on TV and it's some like come on down to F- Phil Smith Ford. Phil Smith Ford. We've got the best Ford trucks. In RVs, Phil Smith Ford, come on down this weekend. Big sale, Phil Smith Ford. Phil Smith Ford, come on down to Phil Smith Ford. And I'm like, okay, you didn't get this uh, car dealership because you were the smartest cookie, you know? (laughs) You didn't get this massive, uh, expensive car dealership because you went to business school. Yeah. Something tells me your past has some dead Indians in it. Yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, the law enforcement and, and police and shit couldn't solve this murder spree or just didn't fucking feel like it. So the Osagi Indian tribe went to the U.S. government and the U.S. government turned to a brand spanking new government agency called the FBI, the FBI, I yeah. guess is what they yeah. Back then, because it was brand new. We don't know what to call this, so we're going to ask the FBI for help. Yeah. Yes, Maxwell? Yeah. Yes, Maxwell? You're hungry? Okay. Do you want some slap it a face I always have some slap it a face no, ready for you. I... Let me give you a little bit of slap it a face slap it a face Sla- How come you don't want any slap it a face I want a peanut butter and jelly. You want a peanut butter and jelly slap in the face? Okay, I'll get my hand. Oh. Put peanut butter on one side, jelly on the other side, and then... That definitely put me on a government watch list. Just yeah. FYI. I'll, I'll make you a sandwich right after I finish talking about dead Indians, okay? Okay. So they go to the Fabai, and yes. specifically, yes. they go to the very young head of the Fabai at the time, 21-year-old future cross-dresser J. Edgar Hoover. Yes. He's heading the FBI. He's only 21 freaking years old, and he's in charge of solving the Osagi Indian murders. Goddamn, when I was 21 years old, you know what I was doing? Neither do I. I was way too drunk. Yes. <laughs> to remember anything that happened at all. What are you saying, Maxwell? What, Maxwell? Oh, Native American. Native American. I will... I will... I will give. I will make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich as soon as I'm done talking about uh, murdered Native Americans. Okay. Native Americans. Oh wait! Come over here again. Come over here. Come over here and say Native Americans. Native Americans. Exactly. You said that perfectly. Thank you, Maxwell. <laughs> That's why we talked about squirrel washing yes. today on the show. So, um. 21-year-old future cross-dresser J. Edgar Hoover really wants to impress folks. So he got he he got a team together, including I, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear this. Um it, he had a Native American already in the FBI. Uh-huh. Like the only Native American in the entire US government. And 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 he's like, we need to go undercover. 
So literally, uh, J. Edgar Hoover's folks went undercover in the Osagi Indian tribe for two years. This is, if it wasn't, if it wouldn't seem racist, this is definitely a uh, Leonardo DiCaprio film. Yes. Just closing my eyes and picturing Leonardo DiCaprio. Not as J. Edgar Hoover. He's already done that, but as the Native American who goes undercover. Yes, in buckskins with a lot of fringe. Yeah. 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 So they go undercover for two years and they discover a secret crime ring led by a very popular and successful rancher in the area called William, named William Hale. They called him the King of Osagi Hills and everybody loved him. And as it turns out, he was busy collecting dead Native Americans oil rights like they were fucking Pokemon. <laughs> And he had an army of unsavory types that he would send out and kill all these Native Americans and then bring him the oil rights. And he was just like uh, growing his fortune. So he was taken down. And there was a trial. There's a really sad, messed up part where uh, the the media is like, yes, these men who uh, killed the Osagi Indians uh, are going on trial. Good luck, though. Good luck finding a jury of 12 white people who will actually say, you did a bad thing by killing Indians. <laughs> like, oh, that's that's fucked up. But they were taken down, and people went to jail, and then that's when America was like, you know what? I'm so happy that they caught the uh, Osagi uh, Indian murders. They solved, they solved one big part of it. They didn't solve all of them, and there are still people to this day and the book deals with some of that there are people who are like i'm a 55 year old journalist and i've worked really hard and you know what i'm gonna look back into my past holy shit my father killed someone (laughs) oh my god my father killed someone that's how he got all that money but i'm also thinking i'm also thinking that you know you you kill a couple of indians to get their oil wells you know When is it that when is it become that your your decision to kill somebody becomes based on your OCD? Like if you got oil wells in one area and then you got oil wells in the other area, you know, you got to kill the guy with the oil wells in the middle so that all your oil wells are together. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So so you wind up killing a specific Osagi Indian to to get a sense of symmetry. Yeah, so that you can start putting up hotels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so this was the part where America was like, yeah, um, you know what? Um, I would say that I'm happy that they caught the Osagi Indian murderer, but I don't want to say that because they're still Indians. Let me look for someone who we can really make the hero of this, a white person. I'm done talking about... Native Americans. You know what? I like this J. Edgar Hoover guy. <laughs> you know what? Maybe this is a name that we as an American society should remember. Yeah. Good job, J. Edgar Hoover. I'm sure that you have big things in your future. Like the end of uh, episode one, The Phantom Menace. It's like, well, Anakin Skywalker, we'll look forward to your future. So well, that in that, 19- this this reminds me of an awful documentary that I watched one night, all about Monopoly, because you know if you're doing a documentary on Monopoly, oh, oh, yeah. you can only keep it interesting that long. But that's interesting because uh, maybe that documentary was based on the book that I read because I read a book about Monopoly too, and about so the then, freaking lawsuit and and yeah, so then you know that it, Monopoly Rangers? was actually invented by a woman. And yeah. it was specifically what she had done was made an, an educational tool to try to show the evils of land ownership. Yeah. And that and that land ownership will eventually lead to one person having all the money and leaving everybody else destitute. And that's the yeah. origins of monopoly. <laughs> and that's not surprising because there is no monopoly game that ends in 
35 minutes with everyone playing going, you know what? That was a fun game. <laughs> yeah. That was a really fun game, and I loved it, and we should definitely play that again sometime. No, Monopoly ends horribly. Yeah, Monopoly, Monopoly ends does. with a lot of really pissed off people. Yeah. Monopoly ends with lives, with bridges burned. But then in the in the Depression, everybody was poor. They they just kind of liked the idea of getting all the money and fucking people over. Yeah. Yeah, so then so then the 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 end of the Osagi Indian murders is that in 1925, Congress, who it should say is was indirectly responsible for all of the murders in the first goddamn place. Because America can't stop screwing Indians over. Yeah. Um, in 1925, Congress passed a law saying that only full-blooded Osagi Indian tribe members could inherit oil rights. And white America went, aww, <laughs> that's not fair. Man. Uh, I, I'm sure there was a public outcry. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the end of my first... Steve's historical approximations. Yes, it that was is a... the story of the Osagi Indian murders. It's a fucked up story. And if you would like to learn more about the Osagi Indians, then read a fucking book every once in a while. <laughs> Damn, son. America's fucked up. Yeah, what were you you were you were telling me about something, and I already had in my mind the idea for Steve's historical approximations. What were you talking about? Oh, chicken pox! No, 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 smallpox, smallpox. 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 Yeah. Cowpox. Yeah. Cowpox, smallpox. Oh, oh yeah. Well, smallpox is oh. always great with the Indian community. They they love it. Smallpox, largepox, well, I mean, mediumpox, cowpox. This, since we're talking about that, yeah, the, the the smallpox vaccination is the only human vaccination that has been completely eradicated, a hundred percent. Yeah. And the man that it was responsible for this, he was. Researching and finding that how uh, milkmaids they never got smallpox ever. Yeah. So he tried to figure out why. Well, it turns out that uh, they would milk the cows, and the cows would have uh, this what would be called cowpox on their udders. And so he hypothesized that they don't get it because they um, have a variation of it already in their system to protect them. They have an Im- immunity. Yeah. So he decided to test this theory on his children. <laughs> yeah. He, he scraped off these uh, scabs. He smashed them up and put a little bit of water in them, cut his children, and smashed these uh, cowpox into their system. <laughs> Emerald's face is just priceless here in a way that I can't yeah. describe. This is one reason why we have a whole ethics board. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he after he did that, he yeah. then exposed his children to smallpox. <laughs> and thankfully for them, they were immune. So that's how we found the vaccination for smallpox. <laughs> nice. And why we have ethics boards. <laughs> kind of like nice. how my parents did. Fuck, fuck up pox. family, but nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I mean, I know psychologists have, I mean, it's obvious they've spent years studying their own children. I don't Amber has come out that, now, too. To make a face. I don't see how that works considering you're the one parenting them. So how would you know if you're fucking up? Yeah. And also, did he tell people that? Like, I imagine, like, the reality of science is kind of fucked up where people are like, congratulations on curing smallpox. How did you do? How did you come up with this? Oh, I just fucked my kids up pretty bad. Like, I just... Cut I my kid's arm open, gave kid. them cowpox, and then realized that they're no longer going to get smallpox. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, research. <laughs> Oh, I did it just hitting the books. Like, I imagine there's a lot of stories like that. So, how did you solve this disease? Oh, I did a ton of really fucked up shit to bunny rabbits. Well, I mean, there's... I don't understand why people take psychologists' research on their own children for absolute, considering you're studying your own children, so you are you can alter any of those elements, any of those variables at any time. Because you're the parent and the researcher. Yeah. I mean, well, that that always I, that reminds me of when I was in college, and you, you had to take core classes, and one of them, you, you know, you would have to take some kind of, 
you wound up having to take psychology and in psychology you had to get additional credits by being subjects in other people's experiments which was kind of oh, fucked wow. up so I, I i had taken this experiment um don't know why don't remember what anything said or if the descriptions or anything like that but it's like eight o'clock at night and it's it's in in a kind of abandoned part of the uh campus <laughs> okay were you flatlined I, I i thought i was gonna be and there was like nobody in this building it was like dead quiet and it was dark in the building uh and then up on the third floor was where i was supposed to be and it was like just this dude's apartment <laughs> Okay, and I'm like, yeah, I'm here for the experiment, and he's like, oh, okay, come here, and he sits me down and puts my hand in a bucket of ice, and then he sits down in front of me and looks at me, and I'm like, okay, what what am I supposed to do? He's like, I can't tell you. Well, how long am I supposed to hold my hand in this bucket of ice? It's like I can't tell you. It's like, well, I think I'm done then. <laughs> And I left. And he said, thank you. What the hell? <laughs> like, he titanic you. Huh? What's he titanic you. It's a game we used to play when we were drinking in California. You'd stick your hand in the um, ice chest. Yeah. Where, you know, the ice has inevitably started to melt and it's freezing cold and you see how long you can hold your hand down there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, he so tried. He awesome. tried, but I, I'm not stupid, so I left. I saw a Titanic documentary once where they talked about how uh, the survivors described yeah the survivors described um, being in the water as as having your entire body in a bucket of ice. I can I can only imagine that this experiment is he was trying to find exactly how long it takes on average for a human to get a fucking clue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, how long do people sit there? <laughs> yeah, with their hand in a bucket of ice. <laughs> yeah, I might have another Steve's historical approximations for next week, or I oh, might cool. not. We're gonna, like, we're gonna I see, we're gonna see how it goes. Anyway, the Osagi Indian murders is a really fucked up part of American history. That is fucked like, up. Like the, the U.S. government is directly responsible for like at least 60 murders yeah you know like god damn you know what build as many casinos as you want yes which makes it it, it makes it in the, uh, native americans can do whatever they want as far as yes. long as i care yeah the the only problem is is that is that there are a lot of people opening casinos that are not Native American. Like, at all. Yes, I believe Harry Shearer from Spinal Tarp wrote a book about that. Yeah. And it was a book about a small town, and the small town was failing and had no revenue, so they decided to make up an Indian tribe. Yeah. That they discovered, and like, oh yeah, so we're all related to Indians, and so we're going to build this big casino. Mm hmm It was funny, if I remember correctly. It was short but funny. I don't know if it's even in print anymore, but yeah, I remember really liking it. And then thinking that that could never happen, but no, it absolutely does. So anyway, back to Kentucky Fried Movie. Yes. Let's do a bit of stats. 1977 comedy film directed by John Landis, who is of course. The director of such legendary films as Blues Brothers 2000 and, of course, the 2010 comedy Burke and Hare, which everyone saw. Yes. At least ten times. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm so sick of Burke and Hare stories, frankly. Oh, yeah. Burke and Hare has been so done just over and over again, and, and yeah. nobody's ever really cared much. Yeah, and Natasha just spends all of her time uh, reading Burke and Hare fan fiction. Yeah. But she's not 
obsessed with Birkin hair. There are people with tattoos. <laughs> with Birkin hair tattoos. The film was written by the legendary writing team of David and Jerry Zucker and oh. Jim Abramson, okay, no. I which know. I have a hard time with because all my life I thought his name was Jim Abrams up until the moment I started working on this podcast. Really? I guess my my entire life, my brain was yeah. just auto-correcting. <laughs> so I always thought it was Zucker, Abrams, and Zucker. Yeah. Not Zucker, Abramson, and, yeah. and Zucker. So I'm having a hard time even just talking about this because my brain is like, no. <laughs> but the film was made for only $650,000, which is a remarkably small amount of money. And the film made over $7 million. The film was such a success that the team was given free reign for their next film, Airplane. So interestingly, Zucker, a Abramson, and Zucker um, met in college, specifically the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is also where The Onion was founded, by the way. Nice. When I started work at the bookstore... Uh, in Sacramento, California, we carried the Onion newspaper, which yes. used to come uh, from the Madison, Wisconsin, which is where the Onion was founded, and it had Madison, Wisconsin ads and Madison, Wisconsin stories, and it literally there was a period in time when I lived in Sacramento, California, that I wanted nothing more than to move to Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> Because the onion made it seem so cool. There were they would always be ads for this one restaurant called Porn and Breakfast. Porn and Breakfast. And it was a restaurant. It was only open for breakfast. And they served alcohol and the TVs always played hardcore pornography. Nice. And I'm like, God damn it, I need to move to Madison, Wisconsin. What's the weather like? I have no idea, but I'm moving there. <laughs> this is apparently the coolest place in the world. So they met at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they formed a college sketch group called Kentucky Fried Theater. Yes. So they did skits and junk. Um, they got their best skits and whatnot together. And they used that as the basis for an idea for a movie that they had. They did the rounds of the Hollywood movie studios. And they all said no, because they all said, hey, no one wants to see a movie of just sketches. I mean, it's the 1970s. Where's the crime and violence and corrupt cops and nudity and car chases and devil worship and anti-heroes? That's the 70s. No one in this film has sideburns. <laughs> So uh, Zucker, Abramson, and Zucker decided to make the movie on their own. And that's when apparently some uppity-up real estate magnate, rich millionaire guy said, Hell, I'll finance your film. Just show me a script. So they quickly wrote an actual script, and the real estate guy read and said, Yeah, no! <laughs> so, that, so that in eventually fell through. So that's when they officially said, fuck it, we're making this movie ourselves. So they raised $35,000, and they made a 10-minute version of the film just with some fake movie previews and some fake commercials. And they went through the studio system yet again to shop it around. This time they said, yeah, we already know you said no, but check it out. We got 10 minutes of the movie. And yet again, every movie studio said, hell no. Uh, sure, it's funny, but... Again, this is just a movie made of sketches. Nobody wants that. It's the 70s. But uh, the writing team were so super goddamn confident that their movie was just fucking hilarious that they they kept shopping it around to alternate, uh, to alternate places. And yeah. they got the film in the hands of a movie producer. Uh, no, a movie distributor. And it was his job to just distribute movies to various theaters across America. And 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 the guy said, yeah, this looks kind of funny, but I, I, what, you want me to invest in the film? I don't know if I can do that. 
I don't know if people will watch this. It's just a film of sketches. They don't do the, that sort of film now. So the Zucker Z-A-Z said, how about this? You get this movie. It's 10 minutes long. It's a tiny short. You show that before some of your feature films at your theaters and see what the audience thinks. Nice. Nice plans. Yeah, so the movie producer's like, yeah, you know what, whatever. You got moxie, kid. It's the 70s. I'm definitely <laughs> smoking a cigar. So he he puts the 10-minute short in front of some of his feature films, and he, he did it, and people were literally on the floor laughing. <laughs> people were literally on the floor laughing their asses off, so the, uh, the movie e- exhibitor whose name is Kim Jorgensen. Do you know that Kim Jorgensen freak? He, she, it's yeah. in variety. Some producer's making a biopic. <laughs> so he said, okay, I'll give you some money. I can't get all of the money, but God damn it, this is funny. You know what? Let me talk to some of my exhibitor friends. So he and a bunch of his exhibitor BFFs put all the money together and together, those movie exhibitors gave ZAZ the 650 k for the movie. And boom, the rest is history. See you next Wednesday. And that's the story of Kentucky Fried Movie. There's a lot of skits and a lot of humor here. But I'd like to single out two honorable mentions. I'm yeah. going to look around and see if anyone's paying attention. Okay, two of the girls are here, but they're teens. I'm sure this will be fine. Um... Pointing out two of the honorable mentions from this film. Number one, of course, is what could be considered the feature film. It's yes. the longest bit. It's called A Fistful of Yen. And God damn it, it's so fucking perfect. It is so good. Well, first, throughout the movie, the comedy is just so fast. You know? Yes. And then it comes when you, quick. When you get to A Fistful of Yen, it is such a perfect parody yeah you know just i i i love this whole fucking movie and and i was i i love that parody but one of the main reasons why i love the parody is because of, of just how obsessed i have been in the past with fucking Enter the Dragon. It's yeah. Enter the Dragon is such a good movie, and this movie does such a good job of parroting it. It's just so fucking perfect. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, it's but like, I was it's, happy it's almost see, beat for beat. Yeah, but I'm happy to see that I I didn't tell my wife what movie we were doing and she didn't watch the movie, but I was watching it and she came home from school. She saw what I was watching and she said. What are you watching? Like a, off the side of, you know, she wasn't paying attention. But then she started watching what I was watching, and she's like, oh, my God, that's fucking hilarious. What are you watching? Like, now she meant it, you know? Yeah. And I tried to explain it to her, but, but she thought it was hilarious, and she didn't know Enter the Dragon. Oh, like, she's yeah. never seen a Bruce Lee movie, and she fucking hilarious so that made me happy so that's one honorable mention the other honorable mention i'd like to give is to what has been for so long my favorite part of the movie the fake preview for catholic high school girls in trouble yes because I, I discovered this movie, Kentucky Fried Movie I discovered it when I was like 11 or 12 during that period in time where you want porn, uh-huh. but porn does exist for you. Yeah. You know, maybe your dad's got a Playboy somewhere, but just porn doesn't exist for you. Mm-hmm. Bella has headphones on. Okay, yes, good. So I discovered this movie. You know, it's playing on HBO or Showtime or uh, uh, Skinamax, you know? Yeah. At like 10 or 11 o'clock, and it, 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 it did its job for me (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. like there's a shower scene in that and that was exactly what i needed at that period in time oh the shower scene scene was awesome that was a good shower scene no yes 
you you were you 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 were yeah. not shocked by finally hearing the truth about masturbation. Oh yeah, no, no, <laughs> I was not shocked by hearing the truth about masturbation. Yeah, the truth about masturbation is that if you masturbate, it gives you Madonna's hands. <laughs> what happens when you masturbate and that is it that is it for the show that is it for the podcast this week and i you know i'm I'm very excited i really like the way this episode has uh has gone down i really think that it's funny and and i really hope that everyone listening is hold on hold on okay I'm I'm sorry. What is that lamp doing there? Oh my god. I'm sorry, this is just really weird, but but I'm just doing the podcast and I swear to god I turned and I come back and there's a lamp in front of me. That's like, weird. It's really weird. Like what the hell is this lamp doing in front of me? That's so weird. Hold on, let me pick this thing up. Okay. It's really light, but it's weird. Um, there's some writing on the side, but I, I can't I can't really make it out. Hold on, let me there's like some schmutz on it here. Let me rub let me try and rub the schmutz and see if I can read the Oh my god, the room is filling with smoke. Oh my god, what is happening here? I am magical genie of lamp. I have been summoned here too. Bigger dick. Bigger dick. Bigger dick. Bigger dick. One wish. The only wish. Only wish I have. Bigger dick. Yes. Bigger dick. Bigger dick, please. Bigger dick. A bigger dick. Bigger That's, dick. Uh, I'm sorry. Bigger penis. Is that better? Bigger penis. Bigger penis. I, 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 I didn't even get through my spiel about the whole three wishes things and the rules and the. And then the, the stuff. You don't need to do that. You don't need to do any of that. No, it's fine. I understand it. I've seen movies before. Aladdin, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I don't need three wishes. You don't need to tell me the rules. I have one one wish, and that's it. Bigger penis. I'm not saying I... I'm not saying big penis. Note that I'm, I'm not saying big penis. I'm just saying bigger penis. I've got pretty okay penis, but I want like, like a John Holmes is what I'm looking for. Like a John Holmes. Like a John Holmes, but maybe like the size... Not not just length, like okay, sure, length, John Holmes, but like girth, like 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 thickness. I'm thinking like a like a tall boy of Mickey's, or maybe not Mickey's. Maybe like it can be any alcohol. It doesn't matter what the beer is. I'm just saying like like thickness, like like soda can. But then length, John Holmes. That's what I want right there. Boom, bigger penis. I did just one wish. You can give the other wishes away to like charity or whatever. Just one wish. Boom! Bigger penis. I mean, you can do it, right? I mean, well, I, I mean, well, you can I, I mean, give I, me that, right? I mean, you're a genie. Of course, I could do it. I, I, and. I am a genie. I can do anything. It's just yes. Okay. It, it, it feels weird. I, 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 I feel cheap. Okay. Well, look, I, I, I. Sorry if you're uncomfortable with this, but. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to pull the uh, uh, I'd like to speak to your manager card on you, but okay, you're my okay. genie. You're my genie, and I have one wish, bigger penis, and I. this is the one wish I want. I'm sorry you feel weird about it, but this is my one wish, and you just need to give it to me, bigger penis. Boom, okay, bigger penis. Okay, I'm, okay. I'm ready. I'm fine, bigger penis. Fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> Okay. Yes, I'm ready. Give it to me. Give it to me. Crack up some knuckles here. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, yes. Okay. Bring it. Oh. Sim, Sim, yes. Sala. You know yes. what? No, no, no. I, re- I, I refuse to take part in this. God damn it! I, 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 I one wish. I have one wish. I'm not asking for like more wishes. I'm not asking for like all the money and 
Tucson, Arizona. I'm just, I'm just has one wish. I just want a bigger penis. Do you, do you, I just want a bigger penis. Do, do you I'm understand just... the concentration it takes to be able to perform mag magic of this magnitude? That, th stopped. This means Stop I am going stopped. to have to go into deep, deep trance, mm -hmm. deep, deep trance, where the only thing I am concentrating on is your giant penis. Wah, I'm a vaguely Russian sounding genie. Wah. Robin Williams really made your job seem so much cooler. <laughs> I just, just like to take this time to say, I thought that this you were going to be making jokes and doing impressions that no child would understand, but you're just kind of, you're kind of being a dick, genie. Robin, kind of being a dick. Hold on, Max, while I'm arguing with a genie. I just don't see why you can't just give this to me. I just want one, one goddamn thing. Robin Williams was a bullshit stereotype of a genie which offends us okay you know what you know what okay shaquille o'neal okay kazam kazam was excellent Some... movie kazam get it right and scene thank you thank you thank you why don't you applaud for us maxwell applaud thank you bella Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I am taking vaguely Russian as such a high compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was you. just well, like, it was <laughs> recognizable as some kind of Russian. <laughs> uh, 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 hold on. Hold on a second. Maxwell has a wish. Yes, Maxwell, you have want, one wish? I want one wish. What's the I wish? Want, I want a huge butt. You want a huge butt? Yes. Well. You want like, like a... Like a J Lo or like a like a like a Sarah J. We'll give you a Sarah J. There there is reported proof that Maxwell does in fact like big butts. Oh yes, you do like big butts, and you cannot lie. I don't like big butts, but I just want one. You just want a big butt. Okay. Well, good. Uh, well, we'll try and get you a big booty then, Maxwell. I'll see what my vaguely Russian-sounding genie can do for you. Big butt, no troubles. No troubles. Nice. No, Eleanor, you can't open that. I'm sorry, I won't let you go through the trash. Wham, I'm such a bad parent. Oh. So that is it for the Popoff film. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, Kentucky Fried Movie is fucking wonderful. Next week, um, we're doing a vaguely new film. Next week, we are doing um, the brand new Pirates movie, yes. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Make No Sequels. <laughs> um, I believe it's called Pirates of the Caribbean 5, Dawn of Justice. Dawn of Justice. I believe it's Tommy Wiseau's Pirates of the Caribbean. That would be awesome. They should get on the pirates. The Pirates of the Caribbean in the Big Balloon Adventure. What I'm saying is, I don't think this movie's going to be good. Oh, hi, Jack. What I'm, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> that's my favorite. That's one of my favorite jokes in the world. <laughs> hey, there's Fred. Maybe he's going on our flight to Chicago. Fred, hey, Fred. Hi, Jack. <laughs> Love that. Love that goddamn joke. So next week, we are breaking down Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. For homework next week, we're watching episode one of the bizarrely shunned Japanese supernatural anime. And also next week, I have been sitting on a piece of news for a very long time, waiting for the right time to discuss it and i'm very excited to say that next week we will be talking at length about bald people in mozambique nice very excited about this i've been waiting for the proper time like i didn't want to have to just rush the story of bald men in mozambique i wanted <laughs> enough room to really focus on it so next week, we'll be talking about Bald Men in Mozambique, and we're going to be talking more about the Disney slash Universal Studios feud. There's been some big, big news oh, really? about uh, Disney and Universal Studios, and yeah, 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 some big news out there. Uh, this war might be over. 
but and, we will see what happens. And and and, and I, I'm glad some people like the money, the mummy movie. But again, can't we just have some shit that's just fucking fun? Can we have just why? Why are you doing this to the Universal monsters? I don't need everything to be goddamn dark and gritty. Yeah, yeah. Like everything has to be. Everything has to be a Christopher Nolan movie now. Yeah, exactly. Hey. Exactly. Yeah. Ridiculous. But until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve saying thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. Fart duty. You fart duty douche waffles and poopy tits. You kids need to get better uh, non-cussable curse words. Okay, for a while you were scatting and then you just started speaking in tongues. I love I love playing games. People have Thanks, Maxwell. Okay, you're getting spit all over me and all over Mommy's tablet. Poopy. Poopy? Okay, that's it. You're grounded until you're 40. No. Yeah. No. Okay, you're grounded until you're 38. Is that better? Okay, you're grounded for 30 seconds. Okay, you're grounded for five seconds. How about that? You'll be grounded for five seconds. No? You'll be grounded for one second. Okay, you're off of grounding. See? <laughs> you're not grounded anymore. Good job, Maxwell. You took that grounding like a champ. You didn't even say anything that whole second. Maxwell. Maxwell. What? Uh, you know what we talked about today? What? Squirrel washing. No. You don't seem happy about the squirrel washing. It was your idea. You know how you wash a squirrel? You just put it in a bag and throw it in a river. <laughs> Shouldn't own a squirrel. A squirrel should be set free. Yes. And if the squirrel comes back to you, then it was truly meant to be, Maxwell. This this is true. Yeah. I hope well, you learned. Hmm? Well, I'm not really happy because I don't like omelets being mean to me. You don't like omelets being mean to you? Emerald. Oh, emerald. Okay, I thought you were talking about omelets. Like, what did omelets do to you? <laughs> um, why was emerald being mean to you? I want to see what in one of the in a white box in the room, but I don't want me to. Oh, so you're upset that she wouldn't let you go through her stuff? How dare she? Really? She didn't let me go. Oh, I didn't. You. Or being oppressed. Box. Yeah, you should you should go and tell Emerald stop oppressing me. Yes. Okay. Cut and print. <laughs>